Welcome back, deep divers. Ready to dive into another fascinating topic. Absolutely, always up for a good deep dive. Perfect, because today we're tackling how we learn. And I'm not talking about the usual study tips. We're going deeper, exploring those sneaky processes of imitation, modeling. You know, when you learn by watching others, observational learning. Should be interesting. We've got some intriguing research lined up, a whole chapter from a learning textbook, even a story about a rock band that ties into all of this. A rock band. Okay, you've got my attention. So this friend's band brings in a new guitarist. Talented, but he's mimicking, like note for note, the lead guitarist's every riff. Oof, yeah, big no-no in the music world. Right, so the singer finally calls out the lead guitarist, tells him to tone it down, lay off the fancy stuff for a bit, and guess what? The copycat guitarist stops playing those specific riffs. He changed his tune, literally. But why? What shifted in that moment? Million dollar question. It highlights the difference between basic imitation, what that new guitarist was doing, and the more complex world of observational learning. <sighs> but I'm getting ahead of myself. Before we unravel that mystery, we gotta lay the groundwork. Back to basics then. Let's talk about why we imitate in the first place. Seems so straightforward, you see, you do. But knowing our deep dives, I'm guessing there's more to it. Way more. See, understanding how and why we imitate, especially early on in life, it's crucial. This is foundational learning stuff. Imagine if we had to figure everything out from scratch. Talk about information overload. My brain hurts just thinking about it. So how do the experts define true imitation? Our trusty textbook lays out four key criteria. Number one, the action we're talking about, it's got to be triggered by seeing someone else do it first. Okay, makes sense. What else? Number two, the imitation, it needs what's called formal similarity. Formal similarity. Hmm. Gotta love textbook jargon. Break that down for us. What does it actually mean? It just means the imitation has to actually resemble the original. It looks the same, sounds the same. You get the idea. Gotcha. So it's not just a coincidence. What about the other two criteria? Right. So number three, it usually happens right after the action is modeled. And lastly, that other person doing the action, that's got to be the main reason for the imitation, not some other thing going on. So timing and motivation matter. Makes sense. But what about kids who don't naturally imitate? Are they missing out on this whole learning pathway? That's where things get really interesting, because for a long time, folks thought if a kid wasn't imitating, that was it. But then this groundbreaking study comes along in 1967. Bear and his team, they challenged that assumption. Okay, I'm intrigued. What did they do? They worked with children with disabilities, kids who weren't naturally imitating, and get this, they taught them how. Wow, hold on. They taught kids who weren't imitating how to imitate. How is that even possible? It was a big deal, believe me. This bear study, it's huge in the learning and development world. It proved that even without that natural inclination, imitation is a skill that can be learned. That's remarkable. What was their secret sauce? How did they make it happen? They used a really structured approach, lots of prompts, and crucially, they made it super positive. Lots of reinforcement when the kids got it right. They started simple, gradually increasing the complexity of the actions. And as these kids learned to imitate, something amazing happened. They started imitating new things on their own without needing those rewards every single time. So they didn't just learn what to imitate, they learned how to learn. That's incredible. Exactly. They call it the learning to learn effect, which is a bit meta, but you get the idea. It's like once you build that foundation of imitation, suddenly the world of learning opens up. You're primed for it. That is powerful. It's like the snowball effect. Mastering imitation early on could have this ripple effect, making it easier to pick up new things throughout life, which makes you wonder what other seemingly basic skills have this kind of impact. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We've tackled imitation. But what about its cooler, older sibling? Modeling. Huh. I like that analogy. Our textbook says modeling. It's not just straight up mimicking. It's more about learning by watching others in a broader sense. Like think about watching a cooking show. You're learning from a model, even if they're not standing right there in your kitchen. Exactly. And that cooking show, that's a perfect example of what we call symbolic models as opposed to live models where you're watching someone in person. Two sides of the same coin, really. And speaking of videos and learning, this next study just blew my mind. In 2016, Aldi and their team used point of view videos, you know, like you're seeing through the person's eyes, to teach everyday life skills to young adults with autism. Things like cooking, cleaning, all that practical stuff. It's genius. What they found was that by using a learner's perspective, having them see the action as if they were performing it, it actually boosted learning. Something about that first person viewpoint 
just clicked. It's like they stepped into the shoes of the person doing the task. So mm -hmm. simple, yet so effective. Makes you think about all the things we could be teaching and learning more efficiently if we just shifted our perspective a bit, right? Mm -hmm. But that's a conversation for another deep dive, I suppose. Agreed. Okay, for all our listeners out there diligently taking notes, let's turn this into a little how-to guide. How can we use modeling effectively in our own lives? Luckily, our source gives us some great pointers. Think of it as a cheat sheet for better learning. I'm all ears. Number one, it really helps if the person you're learning from, the model, is someone you can relate to. The more you have in common, age, background, interests, the better. We're hardwired to connect with those who are similar to us. It makes sense that it would extend to learning as well. Exactly. And here's another big one highlighting the key parts of what's being modeled. Don't bury the lead. Make it clear what we should be paying attention to. No one learns well from a jumbled mess of information. Less is more, especially when it comes to learning new things. Give us the need to know information up front. Precisely. Clear instructions paired with a good, relatable model, that's a winning combination. But it doesn't stop there, does it? Of course not. What good is learning something if you don't put it into practice? And that's where practice and, equally important, feedback come in. Absolutely. Practice makes progress or something like that. And that feedback loop, it's crucial for refining our skills, for catching those little mistakes before they become big ones. We learn from our mistakes, but having someone there to guide us through those mistakes, to offer constructive criticism, it can make all the difference. All right. So we've covered imitation. We've explored the ins and outs of modeling, but we still haven't solved that rock band mystery, have we? We haven't. And trust me, the answer lies in the intriguing world of observational learning. It's about strategy. Strategy. Okay, tell me more. So with observational learning, we're not just copying what we see, we're taking it a step further. How so? We're watching what happens to other people and using that information to make choices about our own behavior. So it's like learning from their successes and mistakes without having to go through it ourselves. You got it. Remember that patch of ice I mentioned earlier? Yeah, the one I'm definitely avoiding. Exactly. <laughs> you saw someone slip and now you're using that observation to inform your own actions. That's observational learning in a nutshell. So I'm not just being cautious, I'm being a strategic learner. Precisely. And if we circle back to our rock star friend. Ah, yes, the observant guitarist. He was doing more than just mimicking. Remember how he stopped playing those specific riffs? Yeah, after the singer called out the lead guitarist. He was paying attention to the consequences of those riffs. So he learned by observation. But it's more than that, right? It's like he was deciphering a code, figuring out the unwritten rules of the band. Exactly. He learned which risks to avoid. Not from any direct feedback, but by observing the dynamics between the singer and the lead guitarist. Talk about a quick study. Makes you wonder how much we learn this way without even realizing it. It's happening all the time. We pick up on subtle social cues. We learn from the experiences of others all through this amazing process of observational learning. So how do we tap into that? Is it something we can cultivate or are some people just naturally better observers? The good news is we can all get better at it. Okay, I like where this is going. Our trusty source breaks it down into three essential skills for effective observational learning. Think of them as the pillars. Okay, lay those pillars on me. The first one, it's attending. And this is more than just, you know, passively watching something happen. It's about being present, really absorbing the information. Right. Our guitarist friend, he wasn't just going through the motions. He was actively paying attention, noticing those subtle cues. And he was able to adapt his own playing based on those observations. That's attending in action. Got it. So be present, be engaged. What's the next pillar? Pillar number two, imitation. Imitation. But I thought we were talking about observational learning, not just copying. We are. But here's the thing. We need to be able to imitate, to copy behavior, in order to use it as a foundation for observational learning. It's like this. You can't build a house without a solid foundation. Interesting. So even though we're ultimately trying to learn what not to do sometimes, we still need that ability to imitate as a starting point. Precisely. We observe, we internalize, and then we decide how to apply that knowledge to our own actions. Okay, that makes sense. So we're attending, we're imitating. What's the third pillar? What ties it all together? The third and perhaps most crucial skill is discriminating. This is where we analyze those consequences, both good and bad, and use that information to guide our own choices. So it's not just about absorbing everything we see. It's about filtering that information, 
figuring out what works, what doesn't, and why. Exactly. It's about understanding the nuances of cause and effect, oh. and that's where discrimination comes in. Okay, I see how that's crucial for observational learning, but can we actually teach someone to be a better discriminator, especially if they struggle with those social cues? I'm thinking about individuals with autism, for example, who might miss those subtle cues that others pick up on easily. You're hitting on a really important point, and luckily there's some fascinating research on this. Lay it on me. There's this 2015 study by Dickinzio and Taylor. They did some really interesting work with children with autism. Okay, what did they find? Well, they wanted to see if they could teach these kids to tell the difference between right and wrong answers. Right, but how do you teach that without just telling them directly, especially for kids who might have a harder time picking up on those subtle social cues? That's the clever part. Okay, I'm intrigued. Tell me more. They used a system of rewards and corrections, but here's the key. The children weren't told which answers were right or wrong. They had to figure it out by observing how others were being rewarded or corrected. It's like they cracked the code by watching. Wow. So these kids were essentially learning right from wrong through pure observation. That's incredible. But why is this study considered so groundbreaking? For a long time, it was thought that some individuals, particularly those with social challenges, might not be capable of learning effectively through observation. But this study flipped the script. It showed that with the right approach, we can teach these crucial discrimination skills, opening up a world of learning opportunities that might have seemed out of reach. It's like giving someone a key to unlock a door they didn't even know they could open. Precisely. And that's why this research is so important. It challenges our assumptions and shows that with the right support, everyone can benefit from the power of observational learning. It's about creating a more inclusive approach to learning that empowers everyone to reach their full potential. I love that. It's about recognizing that everyone learns differently and that sometimes the most powerful lessons are learned not through direct instruction, but through observation, through watching and interacting with the world around us. It's amazing how much we underestimate the power of simply watching and learning, isn't it? It really is. We often think of learning as this very structured, formal thing. But so much of it happens organically, through observation, throughout our lives. It's like a constant feedback loop. We're always observing, processing, adjusting our own behavior based on what we see around us. Exactly. And the more we understand these processes, imitation, modeling, observational learning, the more effectively we can learn and grow. Well said. Okay, deep divers. We've covered a ton of ground today, from those rock star guitarists to groundbreaking studies on imitation and observational learning. We've seen how these learning processes aren't just for kids. They're essential skills we use throughout our lives, whether we realize it or not. Absolutely. So as we wrap up this deep dive, I want to leave you with a final thought, something to ponder as you go about your day. I'm all ears. Think about a time when you learned something truly valuable, not from a textbook or a lecture, but by observing someone else. Maybe it was a mentor, a colleague, a friend, even a stranger. Someone who inspired you, challenged you, or simply showed you a different way of doing things. Exactly. What did you learn from that experience? How did it change your perspective, your approach? Those aha moments, they're often rooted in observation, in those subtle lessons we pick up along the way. It's about being open to learning from every experience, from every interaction. You never know where that next bit of wisdom is going to come from. So true. Stay curious, keep those brains engaged, and we'll catch you on the next deep dive. Until then, happy learning. <laughs>